It's a great pleasure for us to be here, isn't it, Margaret? It is. Margaret it is. says we're Thank just to have a, a blether and enjoy ourselves, so that's, that's right. what we're going to do. Um, Reverend Dr. Margaret Forrester. I can't get used to that myself. <laughs> Margaret knew from childhood um, that she that's wanted right. to serve God, yeah. that she had a, a, a calling. But what she didn't know, of course, at the age of eight, was that when she grew up, she wouldn't be allowed to be a minister, mm. as her paternal grandfather was a minister, because, of course, the Church of Scotland ordained only men at the time. But from the day that she went to study divinity at New College here in Edinburgh, Margaret always believed that one day change would come. And so it did 50 years this ago this year. And it was thanks to the determination and the faith and the intellectual strength of a group of women in the church who led the way. And Margaret was one of those reformers. And the first thing I, I, I was wondering about Margaret is whether you actually think of yourself in that way. Do you think of yourself as a, you know, as a reformer, as a pioneer? Not really. I, I still think of myself as a parish minister, mm. retired. Um, I try to be retired, but I keep being called back. No. You mentioned the age of eight. Um, before this meeting, there was a young person being interviewed. She was 15. I think on average, the people listening to her were older than you lot, so they were old. Um, now, I feel passionately that children can hear the voice of God. I don't mean uh, like your mother calling you for tea, but I mean can be aware of God and aware of a sense of purpose in one's life. And so I experienced that from a very early age. So and I think it's terribly important that we don't ever lose faith with young people and talk to them and keep them going. Um, so what, what was your experience at the age of eight then? Well, it was rather banal. It was a church Sunday school, a fairly full Sunday school, and a missionary home in Furlough, who challenged us to believe that uh, God could call us. Now, it was a typical sort of Sunday school, and I was not goody-goody. And the great thing was we had those canvas-backed and canvas-seated chairs, you know the kind? And we used to, when it was boring, we would lean forward and kick the person <laughs> in front so that they would jump. And we all did it, and I did it. And I was doing it when this woman from, I don't know which country, somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, she suddenly said, do you know, it is perfectly possible that some of you here today may be called by God. And I stopped in mid-poke and thought, no, not really. But I did start to listen. I think she was a teacher. Um, I went home and told my mother with great confidence that God had called me. And she said, well, I mean, she was a teacher. She knew a bit about children. And she said, that's nice, dear. Um, thinking, maybe it'll pass. Um, well, it didn't pass, <laughs> because that was a very long time ago. Um, but I did say, so what can I do? And she said, well, girls can't be ministers. And at the age of eight, you accept what you're told. And it was true enough. I hadn't seen any women ministers. All ministers were men. And she said, so you could be a missionary. So you could be either a doctor or a nurse or a teacher. So from then on, I decided I would be a medical missionary. But jumping ahead, you, you, you then ended up um, going to New College. But in between that, you were a very regular church goer. Oh, yes. And, and what I wonder is, in the time, you know, in your period of, of sort of late teen years and into, into your 20s, the Church of Scotland at that time, mm 
Um, you said you'd never seen uh, a woman minister before. What was it like? What do you remember the church being like at that time? Sunday school was almost compulsory for certain children, even although the parents didn't go. And it was a hard life on a Sunday for a child because I used to go to the 11 o'clock service because that was expected. And my father had died when I was young, but my mother went, um, and my, my sister. Um, then home for lunch, and then Sunday school was in the afternoon, so we were back at two o'clock. It's just amazing. And there, there were always other people here who've been through that. Um, and then because I was actually terribly goody-goody, I, I liked the six o'clock service. There was something about it that was peaceful. And again, <laughs> there was an extraordinary sense of um, vision that my mother had. Uh, I said, I find the sermons boring. And she said, well, so I was allowed to take a book to read during the sermons, you know, Enid Blyton and the famous five or whatever and stuff like that. And I still think it would be a great idea to let children not have to sit and listen to stuff that bored them. I wasn't allowed to read during the prayers <laughs> or the readings, and I didn't want to during the hymns because I enjoyed singing. Um, but that was just a pattern that went on. And then it was Bible class and youth group. And at school, a wonderfully run scripture union. And I found that uh, invigorating. It introduced me to, it was an all girls school, and it introduced me to girls who uh, went to the Baptist church. They were part of the brethren community. So in a way, very different um, from me, but... But I'm but just wondering, somebody like you, who, you know, from the age of eight, mm -hmm. had, had a, a clear kind of sense of mm -hmm. vocation or vision, mm -hmm. in a church that said women couldn't be ministers, mm -hmm. at a time where all kinds of things, you know, if we're getting into the early 60s, were happening in society all around mm -hmm. you, did you not kick or rebel against that institution at the time? Well, you're jumping over the 50s. You see, the 50s, I think, was a decade of acceptance when people after the war were trying to get back to pre-war times. Um, and I started going to university in the 50s. Um, and because I had planned that I was going to be a medical missionary, I actually got into the medical faculty at Edinburgh University. And um, in those days, they had a large composite year of about 240 for medicine, dentistry, and veterinary medicine. And we all did the same basic year. There were 240 students, of which 20 were women. Um, so that in itself is an inequality. Um, and the one thing I regret, I, I discovered within the first month that, blow me, these people wanted to be doctors. And I wanted to be a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the wrong place. So I was able to move um, to do an MA. And that was during the, the late 50s. Um, what about when you got to New College then? If you well, knew you couldn't be a minister, what were you wanting well, to do at New College? The great college? thing was, when I was at university doing an MA, um, James Blackie, who was the university chaplain, ran a conference uh, on a Saturday, and it was packed out, and it was just called Full-Time Service in the Church. And Mary Lusk spoke at it. Now, I think she spoke advocating the diaconate. That's my memory. She was encouraging girls, because it was only open to girls then, um, to be part of the diaconate. And she was Mary Lusk, who later 
presented the petition Absolutely. to the General Assembly to, yes. to uh, allow women That's to be right. ordained as ministers. And I spoke to her during one of the breaks in the Assembly and I said, I'm interested in what you're saying about work in the parish because this seems to me to be what I would like to do. Um, but we talked about it and I said, what's this you've got about license to preach? And because, I mean, she had fabulous academic qualifications, uh, an Oxford first and then a BD at Edinburgh with distinction in systematic theology. Um, and she was the first woman who was licensed to preach, which was a kind of a, the church giving her a halfway towards ordination without any promise of anything more. And that was when I thought, that, that's, that, that's what it is. It's not medical missionary, it's, it's ministry. Um, so, that's it. so let's talk about prejudice then. When oh, you were, we could write a book about that. <laughs> you know, so the, the beginnings of, of, of this movement, I mean, it started, you know, a long time ago, but it was mm. hotting up mm. in the 60s. Mm. And you had uh, gone to, to New College and yeah. you'd sat your minister's um, ordination exams, although you weren't allowed That's to right. be one. That's right. What were the attitudes then? You know, were you a second class citizen as a woman? Was there active prejudice? Yes. Um, not in the university. I mean, the university opened its doors to women in the 19th century, but the church was really pretty divided. And um, there were some ministers who were so against the idea that they were downright rude, actually. Um, but there were others who were immensely supportive. Um, Professor J.S. Stewart, uh, Professor Robin Barber, um, lots and lots of them were really supportive. So, yeah, but there were some who, and, and even after uh, uh, women were ordained, Catherine uh, Hepburn, uh, some people remember sadly she died in young um, and uh, she, when she was a minister in Garganuk, I think it was, um, she was arranging a wedding and a senior minister who had been a moderator retired said to the bride to be, but I could do that wedding for you. You surely wouldn't feel married if you were done by a woman. <laughs> and that was after. Yeah. It, 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 you know, I mean, Catherine was ordained. I mean, do, do you think, th I mean, there were clearly uh, theological arguments, mm -hmm. in other words, bits mm -hmm. taken from the Bible mm -hmm. to, to, right. um, to, to, to oppose the ordination of women, but there was also just basic um, misogyny, wasn't there? Yes, I, and often it was dressed up as a biblical thing. Mm -hmm. And the other argument against was the ecumenical one where a, a lot of people who were involved in the ecumenical movement but were really not very much in favor of women ministers would say things like, oh, we cannot possibly ordain women. Uh, we are in conversations with the Church of England, so we, 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 we can't upset the Anglicans. And my response to that was always, but if it's right for us in Scotland, then in God's good time, it will be right for the Church of England as well. And that is what happens, of course. The other thing that I've wondered about, about this was that we talk about the opposition from, from men, but it, it's certainly the case that a lot of women, perhaps, were not mm -hmm. particularly keen to have a woman minister either. Yes, I think, I think that's true. Um, I spoke to one woman who must have been about in her 50s when I spoke to her, and she was against. She was a minister's wife, president of the guild, and we talked about it, and then eventually she said, I'm not really against it. I w just wish it could have happened earlier, because I would have done it too. Mm. And I think a lot of the 
women who were against had a sort of sense of, ah, oh, it might have been me. Um, um, but of course there are others who, and there are still parts of the Church of Scotland where they don't have elders. Mm -hmm which is more a cultural thing, perhaps, mm. in, in the Northwest, rather than theological? I don't know. When it, um, when it came to 1963, when Mary Lusk mm -hmm. um, made the petition to the assembly, and then it was not exactly kicked into the long grass for, you know, for four years, but it mm -hmm. was sent to be discussed and discussed. Mm -hmm. And then 1967 came, Mm -hmm. And that was the point at which people like you and others began to lose patience that yes. nothing was really happening. Yes. So you, you, um, you all, six of you signed this letter, which, famous letter. which you wanted to um, present to the, give to the, the, the commissioners to the assembly That's right. that year. That's right. Um, I just want to, to read the beginning to the copy of it. It says, this appeal comes from six women who believe that they have been called to the Ministry of Word and Sacraments and that the time has come for the Church of Scotland to take a decision on this question. And then you've signed May 1967. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us the story about how difficult it was for you, actually, to get this letter into the, into the public forum because you yes. wanted, all you wanted to do was to let the commissioner yes. see it. it what it did the church say? <laughs> it's quite a story. Um, could I just say to begin with, I was up in the students gallery in 1963 when Mary Lusk petitioned. And just to give you the atmosphere, looking down from the students gallery, it was a sea of black. And with the occasional bald head. And uh, when I say black, I mean black. And there were no women. And she was escorted to the bar of the assembly. And she'd said to me, do you think I should wear a hat? And I said, oh, I wouldn't bother. She said, well, I think I shall. And she <laughs> wore a dark suit and she wore her black Oxford cap because she just didn't want to give offence. So she, she just felt she had to be careful. Anyway, 63, she petitioned. 64, the panel on that doctrine reported diligence. And my husband to be, who'd come back from India, where he was a teacher with Madras Christian College, he was a missionary of the Church of Scotland. He came back on what one of his friends called passionate leave, <laughs> <laughs> and we we got engaged in May and married two and a half weeks later, and then I went out to it. But he spoke at the assembly. Um, the panel on doctrine reported diligence and their report was about two sentences long and I remember when I was up in the students gallery thinking I wonder if I'm going to marry that man I mean I wonder if he's sound about these things <laughs> and he went up uh, and he, he, he was um, not a voting member but he was allowed to speak and he said if one of my students, after a year's work, had produced a paragraph as uninformative <laughs> as this, I would find it hard to commend them for diligence. And the assembly just roared with laughter. And I thought, yes. <laughs> he's the man for me. He's a good guy. <laughs> um, later on in 67, we were home in furlough by then. And by that time, six of us were really feeling that the panel and doctrine, which is the long grass you were talking about, had done nothing. Or was it that the convener and the secretary were actually against the ordination of women? And I think, in fact, they were. They were. <laughs> they were. So you did this letter. Now, so, how, did you, how did you push the letter? Well, we felt we've, we've got to ask the assembly to come to a decision about this. We can't hang around. We produced the letter and then, and it was all down to me because Mary didn't want to get too involved. 
and I think the others were too shy and I was pushy. And so and that was on Ferdo. So um, I asked permission to put it in the pigeonholes. And I was told by the clerk uh, to the assembly that I couldn't do that because it might influence people. <laughs> I thought that was the point of the pigeonholes <laughs> and information and so on. So uh, we weren't allowed to do that. And I said, well, can we hand them out at the gate? And we promised to pick up the bits afterwards. No, we weren't allowed to do that. Um, and I remember going home to Duncan and our new-ish baby saying, um, we can't do anything. He said, don't be silly. You've tried every legitimate means. Hold a press conference. <laughs> do that. Oops, sorry. Am I okay? Yeah. Um, he, he said, look, you've tried the assembly. You've tried one-to-one -one George Street. You've tried to get a room. Have a press conference. So eventually, long story, we couldn't get it in the assembly because there wasn't room. We couldn't get it in one-to-one -one because all the staff were up the mound. So Eventually, it was the YWCA that used to have a room, a, a premises in Randolph Crescent. And we went there, and uh, they were delightful, and said yes. So the six of us arrived in good time, and we waited in a biggish room, and we waited, and we waited, and we'd invited all the press, and we waited. And 10 minutes after the time it should have started, there was a knock on the door, we thought, oh good, somebody has come. And a member of staff of the YW said, are you not coming to meet the press? And we said, well, we thought they were coming here. No, no, no. They... And when we went into the room, the entire press had deserted the mound and come down to the YW because this was the news. And we had photographs and items, well, on every newspaper in Scotland, a small noted paragraph, I think, in the Times. Um, and it was mentioned in the BBC radio. So inadvertently, by not letting us yes, yes. use the proper means, yeah. we'd reached this huge public. The so whole instead of, of engaging with it, they had actually given you far That's stronger right. ammunition. Absolutely. Anyhow. And so it, that really gave the push so that the, the next year it came back to assembly. Well, it was that year that was interesting because that year the assembly forced a debate and they were not going to accept the panel on doctrine doing diligence when they clearly were not doing diligence. Um, there was a spirited debate and there were some wonderful speakers and remember that at that time there may have been one elder there who was a woman because that had been passed in 66 but uh, it was a great debate were great. you there were you in the gallery absolutely yes. and your husband spoke didn't he i think he probably did <laughs> who looked after the baby <laughs> I had a wonderful mother-in-law, <laughs> Isabel Forrester, really promoted the whole idea of you know, the ordination of women. So I think grandma was called in. I read somewhere that, that the students in the gallery were so rowdy sometimes that the, the moderator a couple of times had to say would clear yes. the gallery unless people right. behaved. Was that, that, was you, were you part of that, Margaret? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it wasn't. All, I think I was the only woman there. The others were men, uh. and it was J. S. Stewart, who, of course, was one of our teachers, and he did say, "However sympathetic one may be, <laughs> I shall have to clear the gallery." Uh, but but we didn't. We behaved ourselves. Uh. And then can I can I read something else that that there was that debate and basically. The debate. The, the big debate was then. Yeah. And Graham Bailey, the minister of St. Martin's, he's my hero because he just consistently, persistently pursued the ordination of women. And 
we had no voice. It's hard yeah. now, when you look at the General Assembly, to realise it was entirely male. We had to rely on the men promoting us and the men voting mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. So Graham Bailey was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so 67 was the big debate. Went down under the Barrier Act. And so we sent out to press we were back to in discuss. India. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then, I have here, this was from 1968, so you were away in mm -hmm. India 1968. We this is a telegram, 23568, uh, telegram which Margaret received from her mother. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. Wonderful woman, Isabel Forrester. <laughs> which says, sweeping victory for ordination of women, mother. That's right. It's <laughs> a bit of history. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I had that on my mantelpiece and Duncan said to me, that's going to fall to bits. I think you should frame it. So I did. So it, there it was, mm. 1968, women were allowed mm. to be or, ordained. Mm. And the thing that fascinated me is, I, I thought of that as, oh great, the next year, everybody, you know, there were mm. masses and masses of women ministers. But of course, it didn't happen that way. It was a no. very gradual thing yes. because women had not only to to be ordained, but then this whole thing about being called to a, to a parish ministry, which is yet another another yes. step. So in fact, you weren't you didn't get your first um, parish in in Scotland and in, in Edinburgh well, until about ten ex years until later. Until 1980, I yeah. was ordained in 74. Catherine McConaughey was the first woman to be ordained somewhere in Aberdeenshire. Mm. She had been, I think, a deaconess, mm. and she'd done a BD. Uh, she was fully trained, she was ready. So she was ordained very soon after. Um, I remember one of my professors saying to me, typical of the Church of Scotland, they got her on the cheap because she actually, well, she paid for herself through the training. She had, was already retired as a deaconess, but she was put somewhere so that they didn't need to pay her. Mm. But do you, uh, there's, a f there's a story I read about, about Effie Irvin, Euphemia Irvin, who was the first woman to, to be, be called, uh, called to, to a, a parish. parish. And That's that was right. 1972. And, and she told a story about um, a man in her congregation that she'd gone to visit and he'd said to her, he said, well, uh, you know, I'm a minor and you won't know anything about that, so I can't, I can't talk to you about that. And she immediately arranged mm -hmm. to go down a mine, yeah. you know. But, but th the point being, was there that sort of sense that, that somehow women were, you know, different species, different experiences, and therefore they couldn't minister? I think that's right. And I think there's no doubt that most congregations at that time when they had a vacancy committee, and that's what it was called then, would say, well, we're not going to have a woman. You know, and, yeah. and there were lots of men to choose from then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've got some members of St. Michael's here. I mean, I have not drummed them up, I promise you. They've come <laughs> of their own accord. But um, when I came in 1980, a senior elder who'd been on the vacancy committee said, when we got you, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> now that was because it was a, a terminable <laughs> appointment and it was assumed that, you know, the church was going to be closed after mm -hmm, three years. Mm -hmm. And of course, a man who was married with a family wouldn't choose to go there if he could get a more secure post. So there you are. He had the grace to say three months later, you're really the minister we needed. <laughs> so, Just a couple more questions before we take questions to the audience. Um, I want to give you some figures. So as, they, uh, as of the end of 2017, there were 559 male parish ministers and 194 women in the mm -hmm. Church of Scotland. Mm -hmm. So that's about 25% women. Yes. Mm -hmm. So after 50 years, what is that good progress? I 
wouldn't have thought so. I would have thought we should have really have been more half and half. Um, I'm interested how many women there are in the General Assembly, but I think that's perhaps because it's the 50th anniversary, maybe presbyteries have sent like more women, mm. I don't know. Um, I, I didn't know those statistics. Um, I mean, it's in, here's another. It's an interesting that, that of the of ministers currently being trained, mm -hmm. and this says, says something about the reduction in, in people wanting to be mm -hmm. ministers. Thirty-seven are men, and thirty-five are women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that looks as though it's going to be more even up, but it's probably not enough to sustain parish yeah. ministry in Scotland. Yeah. We have yeah. to think again about the pattern that we have. And one more, and then question one. Okay, okay. Sorry, I've been talking too much. Well, I just can I just <laughs> ask one question about complementality. When I talked to Margaret a few days ago, and I asked her what was important and made a difference about having women ministers in the church, you used that word complementality, mm -hmm. and it's basically because the church should be no different from the rest of society. Yes, and, and you know, the great text is in Christ there is either male nor female. And I think therefore that means in the ministry of the church there should be no male nor female. And it's not that one is better than another, it's that we have different gifts to bring, sometimes the same gifts to bring. And it makes for a richer a richer ministry if there are men and women, as, as it is in the Kirk Session, a richer Kirk Session with men and women. Okay, I'll get a row if I don't ask. I have a question now. There's probably just, it's been a brilliant discussion, probably just time for a couple of very brief questions. Maybe take them together, do you think, Anna? Sure, yeah. 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 If, uh, and there should, I've got a mic here, uh, and there's a roving mic here. Have we got two very quick questions? Oh, it's been so, so brilliant. Unless you want to do one final one, Anna. Well, we needn't have stopped after all, Mark. No. <laughs> but we're, 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 I'm so sorry. we're on a very tight time. Table. I'm sorry. But if there's one more, that's great. Unless there's any more on the floor. No? Well, looking back over the, the mm -hmm. 50 years, what's still to be done, Margaret? I mean, you, you know, you, you, you were a former, you were a pioneer. You changed a particular aspect of the church. And it's a church clearly, clearly that you love, mm. but there's, you know, what, what needs to be addressed now? I'm just sad that there aren't more people coming forward with a vocation. I found parish ministry an exciting and exhilarating and satisfying way of living. It's absorbing, if you're looking for an eight hours a day, you know, five day a week job, that's not it. Um, I remember we had a Sunday school picnic or a church outing, and it was actually just on midnight when I remember having had a shower to get the grass out of my hair and everything, climbing into bed and saying, I'm shattered, and the phone rang. And this was to tell of an accident in which one of our young members had been killed. You get up and you dress and you go to the infirmary. Of course you do. Um, and, and not everything is as exciting and tragic as that, but just such a wonderful job. And I wish I, wish I could persuade more young people to, to go in in for it yeah Mar oh, Margaret thank you very very much indeed thank you